This is the sixth in a series of lectures on algebra for students of MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In this lecture, we're going to move a bit away from algebra and look at the theory of real polynomials in one variable and the theory of complex polynomials in one variable. For example, consider the polynomial function of one real variable x, which is uh, 4 plus uh, 7x plus 17x squared plus 674x to the fourth. So the first obvious observation is if you plug in x is 0, all these terms disappear. So f of 0 is just minus 4, which is negative. So in a graph of the function, it starts off negative down here. Now, what happens for values of x very, very large? I don't know what happens sir, for medium-sized values, but once x gets sufficiently large, we know that the highest term dominates, and that's something I'll leave you to prove as an exercise, that this is the term whose sign decides what the sign of f is for very large values of x, because the other terms are relatively very tiny when x gets to be sufficiently large. It's the dominant term, the term with the highest power of x, that has the the, the the whole uh, the control over over the sign of of the function for large values. So if x is very very large, then this thing at some point well it was negative here, so it has to become positive. And at some point it, after it becomes positive, it stays positive forever. I don't know what happens in the middle here. It could wiggle up and down in all sorts of ways. I don't know. And over here maybe as well. But I know that eventually also for large negative x because this is an even power. You plug in negative powers of negative x, you get the same as positive x uh, for very large x. So it also behaves much the same way over here. It becomes and stays positive both directions for very large x. But we don't know what happens over here and over here. Let's see if we can come up with, uh, with a more sophisticated technique that will enable us to figure out a bit more about what's going on in these mysterious regions. Before we look at that, though, we could, uh, we could say at least that we know that there are uh, is a root here somewhere and a root here somewhere. So there are at least two roots. And because the degree is 4, there are at most 4 roots. Let's consider again a more sophisticated technique. Um, the theorem of Descartes. Descartes' theorem of signs. Um, which allows us to count not all the roots, but to count something about the number of positive roots, the number um, of positive, root by positive roots. So that means x has to be greater than or equal to 0, but the polynomial of x is 0 of a real polynomial. And a single variable, of course, uh, p of x. Um, is uh, is equal to the number of sign changes. Number of we'll see what sign changes mean. Um, sign changes not in the polynomial but in the coefficients. And uh, that's uh, so. I'll explain what, you know, what, the, what those are. That that's in order of degree when we order them by degree. Um, writing out the coefficients, uh, or less by by a multiple of two. Okay, so that's the Descartes theorem. Let's see what it looks like in an example, so we can make clear what we mean by all these sign changes. So we'll. Return to our example of um, f of x was minus 4 plus 7x plus 17x squared plus 674x to the fourth. And we want to look at the signs. Well, there's a minus sign here, and then these are all positive. So this is negative, positive, positive, and positive coefficients in front of the x. And so there's a sign change here, and then the signs don't change again. We can ignore the fact that there's no x cubed term. You might think, well, there's a 0 x cubed. What kind of a sign is that? But we can just ignore any terms that don't appear. We only have to look at the terms that actually show up. Written in order, um, the 0 x is 1 x, 2 x is 4 x is written in, in powers of x. And we look at how many times the signs change. So there's only one uh, sign change from minus to plus. And so um, the number of positive roots
uh, is uh, is uh, one or less by a multiple of two, um, and so it has to be one. Uh, there's one positive root. So that gives us some sense of what the picture looks like. We started off with a negative, uh, where because of the minus four, um, and there's only one positive root. And we knew that once it went positive at some point for the far along enough, it had to stay positive forever. But there was only one positive root, so that has to be what happens. So it can it can wiggle up and down a bit, but it can't have any roots in here. And then it crosses and goes up like that. So we've got some idea, roughly, of what it behaves like. Um, over here, we don't know. Um, we still don't know what happens here for the negative roots. To understand the negative roots a bit better, we could go back to looking at the same example, but we'll let, say, g of x be f of minus x. That'll flip the axis, uh, x axis around backwards. Um, so uh, g of x is then minus 4 minus 7x plus 17x squared plus 674, 674 x to the fourth. So why are we looking at this? We're looking at this g. We really want to understand what f looks like for negative values of x, and that'll be what g looks like for positive values. And so the roots of f for negative x's correspond to roots of g for positive x's, and that's what we'll detect with a the Descartes theorem. So we get a negative sign, negative sign, a positive sign, and a positive sign. You can see in the coefficients. And so again, there's only the one sign change. Um, uh, so the number of roots has to be 1 or less than 1 by a multiple of 2. Um, so it has to be 1. Uh, so there's 1 a positive root of g of g of x. And so there's 1 negative root of f of x. OK, so let's see if we can prove this, this result works. Um, Uh, so we take some polynomial b of x as, say, b0 plus b1x plus dot 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 plus bnx to the n, where these are its coefficients. Um, and of course, it's real. If x divides into uh, b of x, then we don't change roots because x is, for positive roots, x is positive, and so we're dividing by a positive number. We can divide it in, and it won't change anything about the signs or the roots. And so we might as well just divide. Um, And keep doing that until it doesn't divide anymore. And so that means we can assume that b0 is non-zero. All these are, the, these are the terms here. They all have x's in them. That's the term without the x. And we can assume there's a non-zero constant term because we divide it. If there wasn't, we'd have an x factor, and we could divide it in and get rid of it. So we can assume this term is non-zero. And of course, we can always assume for any polynomial that its highest term is non-zero because if its highest term was 0, it wouldn't be the highest term anymore. The next term would be the highest term. So what happens when we look at this polynomial? How does it behave? If we just look at b of x divided by, let's say, x to the n, um, and we're interested in positive x's, so we don't have to worry about the sign of what we're doing here. It's going to keep the signs the same. So you get b0 over x to the n plus b1 over x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus bn. And um, what does this behave like? Well, if you let x become extremely large, then it behaves like this. Um, goes to this as x goes to infinity through positive numbers. Um, and then it's plus, it goes to plus infinity. But then on the other hand, um, we know that if we plug in 0, um, b of x goes to b naught as x goes to 0. And so we understand the, the, the behavior in the two limits. Again, this isn't really quite algebra because we're doing things like taking limits. So this is a little bit more, a um, little bit closer to, to to analysis than than algebra. But it's uh, it's it's a nice exercise to think about the, the relationship of coefficients and uh, and and roots. So already we can see that our polynomial goes toward its lowest term for small values of x, and toward its highest term, roughly speaking, at least the same sign as its highest term for large values of x, and so large positive values. And so, uh, so somehow it, it behaves like its lowest term here and its highest term here. And so if its lowest and highest terms are, have different signs, then it has to have a root somewhere in the middle. Let's go look at it the other way around. And suppose, um, suppose that b of x has no positive roots.
then by that same analysis, the uh, the, the polynomial behaves uh, as as we go in towards zero behaves like b naught, and for large values it has the same sign as b n. So if there are no positive roots, those signs have to be the same. It has to be something like this. It wiggles around in some way, but it goes toward b naught here and has the same sign as b n here. And so to have no positive roots, it must have that those are the same sign. So b naught and uh, b n have the same sign. And so there's an even number of of sign changes because we have to start with a less particular sign and end up with the, with the same sign at the other end and so there's an even number of sign changes in the coefficients. So in this situation where we assume there are no positive roots, the number of positive roots is zero, the number of sign changes is even, and so the number of sign changes is equal to the number of positive roots or uh, greater by um, by an even uh, number, in other words, by a multiple of two, just like we said in the, in the statement of the theorem. So this is working fine. The theorem's fine as long as there are no positive roots. Now suppose that there is a positive root. Suppose b of x has a positive root, say at uh, at x equals a, and so we can write b of x as x minus a times some c of x, where c of x has a smaller number of roots. And so by induction, we can already assume that our result's true for c of x. Let's try and see how this forces the relations among the coefficients. So our b of x was b naught plus b one x plus da 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 plus b n x to the n. And then the c of x has to have its own coefficients, which we'll write as c, c naught plus c one x plus da 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 plus C, it has to be n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, because this has some degree n, and then this is 1, and this has to be n minus 1 to, to, to add up the degrees properly. Now let's see how these coefficients are related. If we expand this out, the, the constant term here has to be the product of the constant terms here, and so we get b naught has to be minus a, the constant term here, times c naught. Okay, so... Um, and then similarly, if we look for linear terms, b1 has to be the sum of all the possible ways of producing linear terms. Here you can get linear by, by x times constant, or linear of constant times x. And so what you get is x times constant gives you c0 as the constant, and then minus a times c1. And similarly, the quadratic term comes by taking um, the, uh, the constant term times the quadratic, or the linear term times the linear term. And so you get c1 minus a c2, da 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 dot, all the way down, and eventually you get to uh, the very last, uh, well, the next to last term, bn minus 1, is cn minus 2 minus a cn minus 1 by the same reasoning. And finally, bn is a little bit different. It's, it wants to be cn minus 1 minus a cn, but there is no a cn because it don't, there are only n minus 1 coefficients here, and so you get this guy, the highest terms um, match. And you can see that because the highest term here comes with the highest term here, which is the x, and then the highest term here. Um, so you can see they have to exactly agree. Okay, so what we have is these agree, and these uh, disagree. They have the opposite sign. These have the same sign. These have opposite signs, and then we can see what happens in the middle. So let's start here at this top coefficient and go backwards and look for the first sign change. The first time there's a sign change, um, suppose that we look through the coefficients this way, this way, this way, for cn minus 1, cn minus 2, and so on, and look for the first sign change that occurs. So suppose that cj has the first sign change. So we're going to assume then that, um, say, let's say, for example, cj might be positive and cj minus 1 might be negative, and uh, doing it the other way around gives essentially the same argument. So let's just assume that. Then we have simply the, the formula says that bj has to be cj minus 1 mi plus minus a cj. But, um, but if this guy's positive, we know that guy's positive. a is a positive root, so it's positive. cj minus 1 is negative, and there's a minus sign here, so minus, minus, plus, plus, times minus, that gives you minus, and then minus, and so therefore this is minus. Um, and so what we've got is, um, is we've, we've ensured that bj is, minus, is negative. So that ensures that bj and cj minus 1 have the same sign. 
So when we hit our first sign change, going from this guy to this guy, on, on changing signs here, we also find that this guy has the same sign as that one. So these two start with the same sign, the, the, the highest order coefficients have the same sign, and as we go step by step by step, the first time C changes sign, B at least has to end, the, end up with the same sign of Cj minus 1. The corresponding coefficients have, have the, the same sign. So they start with the same sign, and then here they still have the same sign, and so they must have uh, the same number of sign changes. So the same, they start with the same sign, they end up with the same sign, and then, so they have the same number of sign changes. or, um, uh, uh, well, up to a multiple of 2, so the bj's could have have uh, 2 more, because this was the first sign change for the c, so it doesn't have any sign, any other sign changes we've missed uh, going all the way along from, from the top. But uh, first time there's a sign change, we find that the b ends up to change to the same sign as the c's, and so the b's could have 2 more or 4 more or whatever, something like that, but some even number more and then end up switching to be the same as the C's at that point. So the, the idea is simply that we start with the same sign, and then every time the C's change signs, they force the B's to change sign the same way. We did this only for the first sign change, but the same argument works for the second and the third and so on. At each step, the B's, when there's a sign change in the C's, the B's are forced to have the same sign the, C, the C's end up with. Um, so the B's therefore has to have changed an even number of times, may, more maybe, um, but uh, certainly no less than, than the C's. But at the very last step, instead of this argument working, at the very last step, something something happens. At the very last step, we find that in fact B naught um, has the is minus A C naught, um, but then uh, C naught has the has some sign, whatever it doesn't matter if it's a plus or a minus. A has a plus, and then we put a minus in front, so that becomes a minus, and so this is the opposite. So B naught is opposite sign to um, has the opposite sign to C naught, and so they had they they kept on having the same sign every time every time C changed signs, but then finally they end up with opposite signs, and so we find that at that point we have one more uh, sign change, so the B's uh, have uh, one more or maybe three more if they are if they had, had as we said we could have had two more four more and so on sign changes occurring in the b's later on in the story but and when we finally get down to the b naught and the c naught term there has to be at least one there and so there has to be one more or three more or five more uh, and so on uh, sign changes than the c's and that proves our res result by induction because we've already assumed that we've proven it for the lower order, uh, lower degree uh, polynomial C. You probably learned the, the Descartes law of signs at some point in secondary school, um, but it is a nice thing to think about because it does have a, a simple argument that explains why why it works and how do we, how do we see the sign changes coming along. Um, we want to think about maybe a more sophisticated technique that actually allows us to count um, roots, not just for positives, but roots in an interval and actually come up with a number rather than um, just come up with a number up to, to subtracting off 2, 4, uh, 6, 8, and so on. The, the Descartes law only gives you the answer up to possibly subtracting some even number off from it. But, uh, but this thing is going to go as an actual number of roots in an interval for a polynomial in one variable. And we get to fix an interval of the, of the real axis. We want the roots to be in here. Um, Okay, so that's what we're going to work on for a given polynomial, let's say, some p of x. So the, the recipe is simply that, um, how do you do, the, do this thing? You'll let p uh, naught of x be defined to be just the polynomial p of x we start with, which is easy enough. And p1 of x is going to be its derivative, which, as you know, is again a polynomial of lower degree. But from there on, we don't use any more derivatives. Um, uh, from there on, we let p2 of x be uh, the um, remain negative, uh, the negative, not the remainder, but the negative of the remainder of um, dividing um, uh, dividing p1 of x into uh, p0 of x, and so on and so forth. Right. So we at each stage we say that we want um, we want p j plus 1 of x 
is the negative of the remainder of dividing um, p, uh, what do I want, uh, pj of x into pj minus 1 of x. And this way, at each step, our degrees go down because we started with a p of some degree, p prime is a lower degree, so we divide one into the other, we get some remainder, we divide one into the other, we get some remainder, and so on and so forth. So we keep going down, 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 and uh, eventually we'll stop. Um, well, when do we stop? We stop when uh, we hit some some pj of x divides, when one of them divides into the last one. And if it divides into the last one, it must actually divide into all of them. Um, so, well, I should say maybe, I think the lettering should be when some pm of x divides into the pm minus 1 of x, we'll stop it at m. Um, and then, uh, because it divides in the previous one, and then that's the remainder from the dividing the previous one, and so on and so forth, it divides into all of them all the way up. This sequence of polynomials, p0, p1, and so on, and we go all the way down to some, to some pm, um, some pm of x, this is called the Sturm sequence. Let's do an example to see how we calculate these things. Um, so if we were to take, uh, as an example, take uh, p of x to be x to the 6th minus 12x plus 10, then um, p0 is just, by definition, the same thing, x to the 6th minus 12x plus 10, then p1 of x is the derivative of that, so 6x to the 5th minus 12, and then p2 of x is the negative of the remainder, negative remainder of dividing this into this, and I won't go through the steps as usual, I won't worry about dividing that into that and giving you the remainder, um, I'll just write down the answer, um, that is, uh, it turns out to be 10x minus, uh, minus 10, and then if you divide this into this, 10x minus 10 into 6x to the 5th minus 12, you get a negative remainder, p3, it has to be the negative remainder, not the remainder, um, negative remainder of dividing 10x uh, minus 10 into the previous one, 6x to the 5th minus 12. So each divides into the previous one, and then you take the negative remainder, and the negative remainder in this case is 6. And so this is the Sturm sequence. It's just uh, p0, p1, p2, p3. And it ends when you get something that divides into everybody else. And of course, that happens here because this guy, uh, that constant, must divide into everything. Um, so over any field, you can divide any constant into any polynomial. But I haven't explained why you'd want to do this. So then we, now we know how to do it, how to do the calculation. But we don't know why we want to do it. We need a theorem that's going to tell us what the point is of doing this kind of calculation. So um, let's let uh, s of x be a function which calculates uh, at each point the number of sign changes. Now it's not, now these aren't in coefficients, these are actually in values, in the values of p naught of x, p1 of x, dot 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 dot, p m of x all the way through the Sturm sequence. So plug in, take a particular number x, a uh, particular value for the variable x, and just plug it in to all the numbers in the Sturm, all the polynomials in the Sturm sequence, and calculate the signs, and then ask how many times do the signs change, and we'll say that the um, expected number of um, roots of distinct roots, let's say, of distinct roots. It's always a question whether we're counting roots with multiplicity or not. In this case, we're counting the number, expected number of distinct roots. Um, expected number of distinct roots of p of x in the interval a less than um, less than x less than or equal to b is, uh, we'll just define this expression, expected number of roots. It's not actually a, you know, a mathematically meaningful thing, what we expect. So, uh, so this is our definition, expected number of roots, what we expect is s of a minus s of b for this number s, which is this number of sign changes. 
So let's work out an example of doing this. Um, we worked out for our polynomial p of x, which was x to the sixth minus 12x plus 10. We calculated out p naught of x, p1 of x, p2 of x, and p3 of x, which were, um, this was x to the original polynomial itself, x to the 6 minus 12x plus 10. This one was 6x to the 5th minus 12. This one was 10x minus 10, and this one was 6. And so what we can do is to look at, at where x is 0 and x is 1. Let's just work out over that interval. We're going to work from the, the interval 0 is less than x is less than or equal to 1. That's the interval we're going to work in. So we'll try x is 0, try x is 1, and see what we get. Plug in 0, we get 10 minus 12 minus 10 and 6, minus 10 and 6. And then uh, um, and then um, at the other end, x is 1, you'll have to work out what happens. You plug 1 in here, you get 1 to the 6 is 1, minus 12, plus 10. Uh, leave you to work out this is minus 1. Um, and then we've got plug in 1, you get 6, minus 12 is minus 6. Then we plug in here, we get 0. And we plug in here, because if you plug in x is 1 into here, you get 10 minus 10. And plug in x is 1 to 6, and you get 6. So what we want to do is to calculate the s of uh, 0 and the s of 1 values. That's the number of sign changes. There's a sign change from positive to negative. And then it's negative still. Then there's a positive negative sign change there. Here we don't have any sign change here until we get to here. We can ignore, of course, 0. And so the sign change is from the negative here to the positive here. And so we get one sign change here and two sign changes here. And so um, that gives us a, an expected number. of sign changes, which is 2 minus 1 is 1. So we're expecting that there'll be one root in, in the interval, in this interval. We're expecting this polynomial to have one root in this interval. And again, this number is expected without counting multiplicities, so we're not going to get a, a multiplicity out of this. It's just telling us how many different roots we'd expect there to be that are, uh, that are thought of as, as number uh, numbers on the, on the x-axis, but without paying attention to multiplicities. Now, why would we call it the expected number if that wasn't um, our expectation? Uh, so we need a theorem to say why we would expect that. Um, so the theorem, which is of course due to Sturm, uh, is that um, if p of x is a real uh, polynomial um, uh, with no multiple roots, at x is a and x is b, two particular values on the x-axis, then the expected number of roots of p of x on uh, a less than x less than or equal to b is uh, the actual number of roots is the number of roots. Expectation is correct. So let's give some uh, some ideas from the proof. Um, the first idea is that if two um, successive polynomials in the Sturm sequence, one after the other, Uh, share a root, then so does the remainder. So does the um, the next remainder. Um, because we took, the, let's say, this one is one of them, and then the next one is this one. We're taking these two, and they have share a root. Uh, but how do we get the next one? Um, the next one is given by the negative remainder dividing one into dividing that into that, divide that into that. And so, in other words, you take this guy and you divide, take a quotient, pi of x 
plus the remainder, and it's supposed to be the negative of the remainder, so we'll write it here as negative, negative remainder. And so it looks like that. But if these two vanish at some particular value of x, then, then you get a 0 here, you get a 0 here, so you have to get a 0 here. And so it has to divide in there as well. The next observation is that the same thing works backwards. In fact, it doesn't have to be the next one you look at. It could be the previous one you look at. Because by the same equation, pi minus 1 of x is some quotient of x, some quotient, I won't worry about what the quotient is, um, minus pi plus 1 of x, um, that if you have zeros here and here, then you have a zero here in the same way. So if these share a common zero, then that also has to have the same zero. So by that reasoning, um, any common root of uh, two successive uh, polynomials in the Sturm sequence is shared as a root by all of the polynomials in the Sturm sequence, up and down the sequence. And if we go all the way up, we remember that the um, that p0 of x was p of x and that p1 of x was p prime of x. And so we know that if they have a common root, um, that uh, uh, is exactly the same thing as a root of multiplicity two or more because to have the, the root, um, for, well, I'll leave you to check that as an exercise, that, uh, that if, if a function, it's, if a, or if a polynomial is derivative, um, share a root, that's, that root has to have multiplicity two or more. So the next observation um, is we ask, we, we point out that if we, um, uh, we could imagine taking a root, take a root x equals x naught of some uh, pi of x, one of the guys in the sequence, in the sequence, but assume that it's not the top of the sequence, it's not p naught of x, and it's also not uh, the last guy in the sequence at the bottom. So somewhere in the middle, we take somebody that has a root. But, um, but what happens um, then? Uh, it, we could, there are two situations. Then it could be a, a multiple root of p of x, or it could be not a multiple root of p of x. So let's try, try and do the first case first, which is that we'll suppose that, um, suppose that this point x equals x naught is not um, a multiple root. Maybe a single root or not a root at all but not a multiple root of, uh, of the original polynomial p of x that we started with. Then by our previous reasoning, we said that if, uh, if it's not a multiple root, then it can't be a root of everybody all the way down. In fact, it can't be a root of any, of any two successives. And so in particular, therefore, it's, uh, it's not a root um, of either of the successive guys of either um, p i minus 1 of x or pi plus 1 of x, because otherwise it'd be a root all the way down and be a multiple root of p of x, as we said before. So in, in a rough picture, um, we have our polynomial, um, which is our pi of x with some root, pi. And then um, we have the previous one and the next one can't have a root the same spot because we said it's not a root of the previous one or the next one. So there might be maybe the previous one, pi minus 1, and we might have the next one, pi plus 1. Or it could be the other way around, actually. It doesn't really matter which is the pi plus 1, which is the pi minus 1. Um, so the other two don't have a root of the same spot. And we should take a look and see what signs, how the signs are related. We have that pi minus 1 of x is quotient pi of x minus pi plus 1 of x. So that's how they're related to one another. And that in particular tells you that um, if uh, where, where there's a 0, if we plug in at x is at this particular x naught, this root pi minus 1 of x naught is, well, this is a root, so that disappears. 
and you get minus pi plus 1 of x naught. So they have exactly the opposite value, exactly the opposite values at this point, x equals x naught. And so for nearby values, since this, this isn't a root, this, this stays positive, this stays negative. They have opposite values. One's positive, one's negative, doesn't matter which is which. And, um, and they stay of opposite values nearby by continuity. Let's suppose, in addition, that um, pi of x, the one we've, that has a root there, has an odd multiplicity. At um, x equals x naught, so that looks very much like the picture we've already drawn. Um, we're thinking about a picture where uh, this pi of x has going to go from one side to the other because it has an odd number of roots, an odd multiplicity at that point. It's going to go from one side to the other, and then these other two functions, pi minus 1 and pi plus 1 of x, whichever one is which, doesn't really matter, uh, they look something like this. So um, so then we can look at the at the picture and we can count numbers of roots and see how they change, or numbers of, si or numbers of sign changes as we go across from one to the other. These had the same sign on this side. We're not looking at at the root, but just before the root. These had the same sign, and these had opposite signs. So there was one sign change in the values of the polynomials. Here, on the other hand, there's one sign change here, no sign change here. So there's still one sign change. So as we go across this this odd root, we go from having one sign change here to having one sign change here. Total number of sign changes is the same, so number of sign changes is the same across the root. Now, um, so as we go from one side to the other root of the root, we go. Um, on either side of the root, we find the same number of sign changes. What happened in st instead? Instead, if we did instead of doing odd number mul a multiplicity, what if we did even? Um, then uh, we get a similar picture. Again, we get um, a, uh, a function p uh, i of x, which has a root here, and then its predecessor and successor functions, whichever is which. One of them's positive, and one of them's negative. And then, um, and it doesn't again. It doesn't matter which is which. So, um, so then the number of sign changes here was well. There are no sign changes here, and there was one here because the values would go from this to this to this. We found there was one sign change in the uh, in the values of the polynomials as you go through the sequence. And here, there's still one sign change because you still have this. These still have the same value, the same the same sign. And these and now uh, still have opposite signs, and so. This is still true. There's still the same number of sign changes on either side of the root. So that reasoning works uh, all the way along the entire picture of the of the Sturm sequence, except at the beginning, at the start of the sequence. Uh, what happens? It's a different picture because um, it's not uh, going to have three functions in it. Um, we're not going to have our current function and its predecessor and successor functions. When, when we're at the start, there's only the one, uh, the, there's only the, the successor. So how does that work? Well, in that case, um, if we have a, a root of our function, our p0 function, remember that p0 is just the original polynomial p we started with, and then it's going to have a, a successor, which is some p prime. Um, and um, the point is that um, is if this guy has this has this um, this root, then um, it's going to be if it's odd. This is even, and so there um, was a sign change here, and there isn't one here because p changes sign with p prime doesn't, or, or vice versa. Um, uh, so if p is is even, then p prime is odd. And so you have a change from having one sign change to no sign changes. And um, so the sign changes, number of sign changes, goes down by one as we um, 
as we cross uh, cross a root. If we go from this side of the root to this side of the root, you know, there was one sign change here, now, there, now there's none. So we killed a sign change. So if we put that together, what we find is that there's these, every time we have a root of, of p, we get a sign change um, in this uh, in this term sequence. But everywhere else we had, there was no sign change all the way through. The number of sign changes, well, the number of sign changes uh, stayed the same all the way through the sequence. And that gives us the result that as we go along, every time we hit a root, we get exactly one sign change in the whole story of this term, this term sequence. So this term, uh, the number of sign changes, difference, difference number of sign changes is actually counting correctly for us the number of distinct roots. Now, um, our next result is one of the giant results in the subject, but we're not going to give a proof of it. We'll just state it. Um, it's a theorem called the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra. Fundamental Theorem of Algebra, and it's due to Gauss. Although he had met multiple proofs, I'm not sure if he had one that was correct. He had several um, probably not quite correct proofs. Um, so uh, the, the result is that every non-constant polynomial, so not just a constant term, P of Z is, uh, by the way, I should point out that it's traditional when working with complex polynomials to make the variable be called Z instead of X. But we won't always do that. We, we'll do it sometimes, not other times. It's not so important. Um, so if we expand out the polynomial, um, with complex coefficients, so complex number coefficients, coefficients, so that's these here, um, a naught, a one, and so on up to a n, and we'll assume we can always assume the highest term is non-zero because if it wasn't, if it was zero, then we'd make the next one be the highest term. Um, so those are our, our coefficients. Every such thing has a um, complex root. And um, as a corollary of this theorem, which is all, also all, all sometimes called the fundamental theorem of algebra, an obvious corollary of this theorem is that, in fact, p of z is uh, somehow factorizable into its highest term times z minus some root times da -da 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 times z minus some root. How, is that, uh, how does that happen? We take by the theorem, there is a root, call it r1, divide it into p of z, and then apply induction. So we can put this in a different language and just say that every um, every uh, polynomial uh, over uh, the complex numbers splits into splits into a product of linear factors. There'll be zero linear factors if it's a constant. Otherwise, there'll be some positive number of linear factors. As I said, we won't give a proof of these of, of the fundamental theorem or this corollary. The fundamental theorem, the corollary is easy from the theorem, but we won't give a proof of the theorem um, because it's actually uh, it, it, uh, every proof would have to use some kind of analysis, and we don't want to do much analysis in this class. We're really in focusing on algebra, but we'll make use of this result a lot. Now, um, there's always some hesitance to use complex numbers. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just use real numbers? So let's see if we can find a real version of this story of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Um, the associated version for real polynomials um, is that uh, every um, real uh, polynomial, so with real coefficients, say p of x, it's a naught plus a one x plus da 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 plus a n x to the n. All the a's are real. Um, splits into a product of linear factors. Of course, a constant could have a constant multiple at the front. Uh, then linear factors, and um, which are real, uh, and uh, then there's some other factors we can't quite get rid of, which we don't get, don't get to be um, to be linear, real quadratic um, quadratic uh, factors without real roots. Uh, 
Um, so that what do those quadratic factors actually look like? They're going to be factors that look like a quadratic function, so ax squared plus bx plus c, but with no real roots. Um, so b squared minus 4ac is negative, those kind of functions. And that's what we can't get rid of. In the complex case, we don't have to worry about those because all the complex polynomials have those real roots. So you can crack them apart into linear factors. In the real case, you get some maybe some real linear factors, and then you get some quadratic factors, but they don't have real roots. And of course, I should I, I should write it all out, but um, it's going to be essentially unique up to rescalings of the factors, um, and maybe rescaling the whole result by a, by a constant. So uh, so that's how these factorizations look, and and also possibly reordering the factors. So rescalings and reordering of factors are are, are are possible, and nothing else really here. Um, so I won't write all that down. Um, we won't really need to to worry about the uniqueness so much. Um, so let's look at the at the proof. Um, well, if there is is a real uh, linear factor, then just divide it out and apply induction, and uh, so so you're done. So we can assume there is assume none. Um, no, well, none. Um, there's no uh, real linear factor, and um, so no real roots. Because if there's a real root, we could plug in um, the associated uh, factorization into it. It'll take a linear to get a linear factor. Um, now, by the fundamental theorem of algebra that we've already stated for complex polynomials, if we allow complex numbers into the story, we do get roots, and so we can take a complex root. say, let's call it Z1. Um, so this is a complex number, it's not a real number. Now we already know there are no real roots, and so Z1 is not real. Um, so let's say Z1 is some X1 plus I Y1, and this Y1 part, this part has to be not zero to keep the thing from being real. Now all the coefficients of, of this Z polynomial, they're all real numbers. So if you write out P of Z, a naught plus the dot plus a n z to the n, and then you put a complex conjugation on top of the whole thing. What happens to that complex conjugation? Well, it just pulls through, and when it hits a real number, it doesn't do anything; it just disappears. So you get a one z bar plus the dot plus a n z bar to the n. Uh, every time the the conjugation hits, it splits into all of these. It gets into all these terms, and in each term, if it's just a real term, it gives you nothing, does nothing to real numbers, does nothing to the a1, but hits the z, and so on and so forth. But that's just p of z bar. And so what this does is to say that when you have a zero, when you have some root, like this z1, you plug it in, you get that its conjugate is also a root. And so the z1 bar is also a root. And so now we have two roots. And they're different from each other because one of them has this non-zero value of y, y1, and this guy has the opposite value, the opposite sign for that value of y1. So in a picture, um, we have that there are no real roots, but in the complex plane, there are conjugate roots. They're lying uh, directly across from one another over the real axis. And then there's nothing on here. No real roots, so not, no roots on the real axis, but there are pairs of conjugate ones. Um, so what, what, what happens then with these pairs of conjugate ones? Well, x minus z1 and x minus z1 bar both divide into uh, p of x as complex polynomials. So we're still working with complex numbers, although I'm using x, unfortunately. Maybe maybe it's not a, not a good choice, but I'm using x for my complex variable now. Um, but that means, therefore, if those two divide, then therefore their product divides, since they're distinct factors, um, distinct linear factors with distinct roots. Their product has to divide in into uh, p of x. But their product is x squared minus z1 plus z1 bar plus uh, z1 z1 bar. And if you uh, work out what that is, that's x squared minus, well, that's just uh, 2x1, oh, sorry, there should be an x here, 2x1x 
plus this is uh, well you can write it as x one squared plus y one squared. So these are this is this is a real number. Um, this is a real number, and this is also a real number. So these are real numbers. X one. Sorry, it's not very neatly written. X one squared plus y one squared. Okay. So um, so these are all real numbers. This is actually a real coefficient polynomial. This is our quadratic factor, and it divides in. Um, so uh, so then, and it has no real roots. And now the question is, what happens when you take the quotient? Um, the quotient of this p of x, let's call this guy q of x, this quadratic factor, p of x divided by q of x. We divide it in, of course it divides in neatly because we said each of these divided in, and so their product divides in, that's this quadratic. It divides in, and so this is a polynomial. It's a complex polynomial, but it's actually real. Um, it's a real polynomial because it's actually a ratio of real polynomials. And so it turns out to be real. Um, and then, uh, uh, so uh, that gives us down, gets us down by, uh, to a lower uh, degree polynomial. This is a polynomial because Q divides into P. It divides in, the result is real because all the coefficients of all of these guys are real. And so then um, we, re we can reduce uh, the degree by induction. So that gives us a proof of the of the factorization for real polynomials by using the fundamental theorem of algebra for the complex ones. So our final topic for this lecture is we're going to think about partial fractions, which come out very, very straightforward from what we've already done. Um, well, we can work over any field, um, although it, it's good enough for, for this um, discussion just to think about the real uh, variable polynomials. Um, so we take um, take any rational function by which I mean um, a rational function is some ratio of polynomials p of x over q of x and these are polynomials and we can assume that we've divided out any common factors if we like um, over whatever field we're working over but again if you like just work with the real numbers for now suppose um, that q of x factors. So q of x is some u of x times v of x. And let's suppose that these are coprime polynomials. In other words, that their GCT is 1. Um, so um, they have no positive degree common factor. Then um, we claim that we can actually split, uh, simplify this rational function into uh, into two rational functions, something over u of x plus something over v of x. We can even write out more or less what the somethings are. There's t of x, p of x, and then there's s of x, p of x. Um, and um, so, it, so it simplifies to the, de the denominators. It doesn't simplify the numerators, but it simplifies the denominators. And, and the, um, the proof is simply that um, you use uh, Bezu uh, coefficient calculation, the standard calculation, to write that for some s and t, which we can calculate explicitly because we know how to do bazoo coefficients, these things have to give 1. Their GCD is up to scaling. We can always arrange that it's 1 um, because that's what it means for them to be coprime, means their GCD is, is 1 or is a non-zero constant, which can be rescaled to be 1. Um, and then we divide, just divide both sides by... Um, by this q of x, and you get the expression we've written here. So, um, so this gives it rise to the notion of a partial fraction decomposition, a, a partial fraction. Partial fraction um, is is a, is a ratio. Let's say b of x over c of x of polynomials. Oh, uh, sorry, c of x to the n to some power n to some integer power. Um, so n is greater than or equal to 1 integer. Um, and uh, where degree of, degree of b of x is less than the degree of c of x. And uh, we can assume that c of x is irreducible. And, um, and hence, uh, these guys are co-prime. So b of x, let's just put that in there. b of x and c of x are prime. A partial fraction decomposition
partial fraction decomposition of a rational function. is an expression of that function as a sum of as a sum of a polynomial plus finitely many partial fractions um, let's say oh, for a part of a partial decomposition of a rational function let's say p of x over q of x, give it a name, um, our part, our, this guy. So it should be fine many partial fractions with denominators. Dividing into this q of x. And uh, of course the big theorem that we, that we probably are somewhat familiar with from previous experience is that every um, rational function has a, a partial fraction decomposition unique partial fraction decomposition fraction decomposition Uh, decomposition up to uh, reordering of the various terms in the in the decomposition. So the the proof is that uh, well, if you start with any b of x over c of x, then um, what you could do is to is to try and um, simply to try and write out a partial fraction decomposition. Um, you start by trying to divide the c of x and the b of x as many times as possible. So you'd have b of x is uh, some quotient of x, c of x plus remainder of x. And therefore b of x over c of x is a quotient plus remainder uh, um, over c of x. And that reduces us down to, to this guy. So, so we can assume uh, that... Um, that degree of b of x is less than degree of c of x um, without danger because we've done we did this and the remainder has lower degree so we can start by getting uh, the degree of b of x down the next step is to um, is to apply uh, the previous result where we showed that we could if we could split c into irreducibles then we could actually write a partial fraction description of, of our ratio b of x over c of x as, as a sum of terms where each term had only an irreducible. Um, and so it's good enough to, um, to, to look at the case where c of x is irreducible. Um, this is maybe just, maybe we should say, just to prove the existence. Let's just prove the existence for now of, a, um, of the partial fraction decomposition. The, the theorem states its existence is unique. We'll just prove that there exists such a thing. Um, and I'll let you worry about why it's unique. So we can apply the previous result where we talked about how to use the Bezu coefficients to arrange that c of x is irreducible and that it has the, that our fraction has the form b of x over c of x to the n uh, rather than b of x over c of x. Uh, now, now we're going to assume it looks like this, uh, but, but that's irreducible. Um, and again, we can divide um, b of x as a quotient c of x plus a remainder of x, and um, thereby get, in fact, that the degree of b of x, again, is less than the degree, not just of cx to the n, but in fact, the degree of c of x. And that gets us the final result. Um, what we do is just split, take the original rational function, again, so we take the original rational function, we try and use uh, division to simplify it to a polynomial part plus a remainder part, then we apply to that remainder part, we apply the partial fraction, uh, uh, bezu, the bezu uh, decomposition picture, uh, to split this guy up into a sum of terms so that each term has, has a denominator, which is a power of an irreducible. And then, again, we divide, do one, one more division to get that to, uh, to have uh, the, the, the numerator have a smaller degree than c of x. And again, you can try and prove the, the uniqueness part. So as a simple example, as our very last step we can see um, as a simple example um, we can look at um, a polynomial 
over another polynomial. Let's say it's uh, x to the ninth minus 2x to the sixth plus 2x to the fifth minus 7x to the fourth plus 13x cubed minus 11x squared minus 12 plus sorry plus 12x uh, minus 4 and then oh it's going off the screen um, let's see if I can do something about that uh, uh, so then and then we'll divide all that by some enormous uh, q x to the seventh minus 3x to the sixth plus um, 11 Oh, plus what do I have here? Uh, I think it's 11x to the fifth minus 7x to the fourth plus 7x cubed minus 5x squared plus 3x plus 1, just to give or minus 1, just to give you a sense of what these things could look like, some horrible, horrendous thing, and it simplifies into something much, much nicer x squared. See, there's two and more x's in the numerator of the denominator, so it's going to be an x squared we get out here, and then it's going to be plus 3x plus 4, and then we've only got these very simple, uh, much simpler terms, 1 over x minus 1 plus 1 over x minus 1 cubed. Note that we have an x minus 1 term, we also have an x minus 1 cubed term, that these are irreducibles, the x minus 1, but we have to have the powers of the irreducibles going up to some power that divides into the denominator here, and then plus x plus 1 over x squared plus 1 plus finally 1 over x squared plus 1 all squared. So it gives you a sense of what goes on that the the um, the denominator uh, is going to be um, uh, an irreducible which is going to involve uh, these these objects, these uh, quantities multiplied together. Uh, they're going to divide into it and so that's where they came from. And we have to include not just an x squared plus 1 but an x squared plus 1 squared. We have to allow that because it fits in twice into q of x. And also, we can see that um, this is over the real numbers, um, over real numbers. But over the complex numbers, it has a different, it has a completely different story because, in fact, we can write that 1 over x squared plus 1 is something like uh, i over 2 over x plus i minus i over 2 over x minus i, I think, something like that. And so... Um, so you can see that actually you get a simpler expression with lower denominators over the complex numbers. So the complex numbers are even uh, doing an even better job than the real numbers at giving us a, a, a partial fraction decomposition, a different partial fraction decomposition. We said it was unique, but um, of course that's because the, we said that it was unique with irreducibles as denominators. Now these are irreducible over the real numbers, but not over the complex numbers. They still split again. And so it is true that, that the partial fraction decomposition is unique over the real numbers, it becomes unique uh, real irreducible polynomials. Over the complex numbers, it becomes unique irreducible complex poly polynomials in the denominators. And at this point, we don't want to go on and think about integrals, but um, there is, an, of course, an important application which, as explained in detail in the notes, we won't we won't make use of it in the in in this uh, in this module at all. But you can integrate uh, rational functions um, using uh, partial fraction decompositions. You can find all the integrals of all the rational functions explicitly. In the next lecture, we'll return to more algebraic material, thinking about the uh, factorization of polynomials over the real numbers and uh, of the rational numbers and the over the integers.